Hey guys, my name's Joseph and today I'm super excited to be filming a video on behalf of the Study Tube project. And considering that none of you are really gonna know who I am, my name's Joseph Edwards and I recently started a YouTube channel called Joseph Edwards where I talk about all things study related and I prepare for university life. I also have a study Instagram called at Educational Tips from Joe. So if you want to follow that, that would be much appreciated. And so considering that it's Shakespeare's birthday, I thought how fitting would it be to film a video on the different modes of tragedy? So let's get into the video. So the best place to begin when looking at the different modes of tragedy is by starting with Aristotelian tragedy. Um, some of you may have looked at Aristotle when focusing on Macbeth or analysing the concept of tragic personality. Um, I'm sorry to all the English literature A-level students who have probably done Aristotle to death if you're doing the tragedy paper, but here's a quick breakdown of who Aristotle is if you haven't studied Aristotle. So Aristotle is essentially a Greek philosopher who wrote one of the only surviving criticisms of Greek drama and Greek tragedy. This was called the Poetics. In the Poetics, Aristotle suggested that tragedy is essentially a matter of imitation. Tragedy embodies sort of the social reality and distorts it so we can see what could potentially happen if we were to commit catastrophic and despicable acts. So the idea then that tragedy presents audiences with a corrupt and perverse version of their own reality links very well, I think, with Aristotle's own obsession with the moral environments that tragedy takes place. So whilst Aristotle is concerned with the tragic personalities of characters and how this links to the catastrophic end, I think he's far more concerned with the moral and philosophical implications of the tragedy and how the tragedy itself can have transformative effects on the societies that consume it. So when looking at tragedy, it's really important to look at the moral attitudes of the time and how this influenced the impact and significance of the text itself. For instance, when looking at a text like Othello and looking at the idea of gossip and deception, it's important to consider, well, why was that so significant at the time? Were people of that period misled or blindly led by like sort of seductive comforts? So I think to get a deeper understanding of the tragedy, look at these concepts, look at the idea of morality, look at the idea of imitation, but really understand what the significance of that tragedy has on you as a reader and on the society as a whole. So lastly, when trying to decide whether or not a text that you're studying is an Aristotelian tragedy, it's important to consider the emphasis that Aristotle placed on action and activity. Aristotle suggested that an effective tragedy will have an episodic construction. That means that activity will be distributed across a series of acts and episodes. So in a Shakespearean tragedy, in a text like Macbeth or Othello, we see that there are five acts that contain act tragic actions that are of equal weighting. So for me, the slap of Desdemona in act four, I believe is equally as significant as her murder. But obviously this is dependent on whether or not you believe that the um, tragedian has placed an emphasis and weighted that action in the same way that you may see the final catastrophe. So when looking at a tragedy that seems to have such an extensive amount of action, it's important to consider that potentially the tragedian is trying to ensure that the audience, like the characters, don't have a sense of escapism from the tragic atmosphere that surrounds them. So, like I was saying, sorry to refer back to Othello, but where there's continuous chaos, we as the audience don't really have that sense of relief or so ability to sort of divert. And that's why at the final moment, there is that sense of being able to absorb in a feeling of catharsis. So looking at the construction, the composition of tragedy will give you an insight into the author's intention and whether or not they wanted the action to be distributed in a way that could be deemed episodic. So hopefully there I was able to give you a good enough understanding of what an Aristotelian tragedy is and maybe a few ideas of how you can apply an Aristotelian lens in your study of tragedy. So now guys, we're gonna move even further in time to 520 AD to take a look at Bohemian tragedy. So to give you a little bit of a background on who Bohemius was, 
Pohuvius was essentially a 6th century philosopher who wrote one of the most famous pieces of prison literature called The Consolation of Philosophy. In The Consolation of Philosophy, Bohuvius looked at the idea of fate and assessed the extent to which humans have control over their own destiny. So the conclusions of this work suggested that humans have absolutely no control over their own fate and in fact we are all under the majesty and dictatorship of a desperately seductive figure called Fortuna. Fortuna in Bohuvius's work signifies all things that are sentimental and materialistic. The relevance of the various manifestations of Fortuna in literature of the tragedy genre is where we see characters blindly leading and blindly chasing what they believe is their fate and their destiny is in fact them becoming victims of the various disguises of fortune. Fortune in tragedy plays such a significant role because it can either lead characters to illusions of happiness or it can lead them to blatant and sort of conspicuous destruction. So ultimately in tragedies the role of Fortuna will often be played as a friend of the tragic protagonist or appear as an opportunity for prosperity. An obvious example of this in the A-level syllabus may be Alec D'Urberville in Tess of the D'Urbervilles or even Iago in Othello. What these seductive characters do is that they appear as sources of happiness for the tragic protagonist in an atmosphere of tragedy. Um, and for us as the audience, we are forced to almost experience the same thing as that tragic protagonist because we're almost seduced by them as well. But when these characters are unmasked for who they really are, it's by this point in the tragedy that fortune has steered the plot to such a point of irretrievable catastrophe. So what Bohemius suggests that we learn from tragedy is that we should become willing to surrender our sentimental attachments to material items or be willing to accept the failure of our relationships with people. So ultimately a Bohemian tragedy is about considering what we attach sentimental value to and where we place the importance of materialistic things. So when looking at a text like Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, using a Bohemian lens to analyse the text will be a great way to understand why Willie Loman obsesses over his position in society and becomes victim of this materialistic and capitalist world. So Bohemian tragedy, I believe, is so relevant to the modern era and modern tragedies. But Bohemius's work is extremely applicable even to some of the original tragedies or even Shakespearean tragedies. Um, so hopefully I've been able to give you a good enough explanation of what Bohemian tragedy is and maybe an insight to something that you haven't necessarily covered before. So now we're going to move even further in time and go to the 18th century to look at a Hegelian understanding of tragedy. So to give you a little bit of context of who Hegel was, Hegel was ultimately an 18th century German philosopher who wrote extensively about concepts such as idealism and dualism. His work attempted to deconstruct the various elements of the modern world, including tragedy, and understand their significance. So Hegel's understanding of tragedy is that it is a conflict between two ethical positions that attempt to destroy each other. So what he means by this is that in a tragedy such as Othello, we see Othello influenced by what his perception of reality is versus the contorted version that Iago presents him with. This puts him into a state of dumbfounding where he's unable to detect whether Desdemona is in fact chaste or whether or not she is the horror of Venice that Iago has painted her as. So the first major point in Hegel's philosophy of tragedy is that he suggests that tragedy arises when a hero asserts a one-sided and just position that automatically violate an alternative position that is equally as justified. So what Hegel's trying to suggest here is that where we see a hero absolutely convinced of the validity of their actions, they're completely blind to the alternative position which could prevent the catastrophic end. So imagine it like a seesaw. To keep it balanced, obviously you have people of an equal weight. When you remove one of the people from the seesaw, it's obviously going to tilt down. So imagine that idea applied to Hegel's dialectics. So essentially what Hegel suggests as a way of preventing such a tragic end is that we allow ourselves to be open to various perspectives and we should refuse to allow ourselves to be completely one-sided. 
So the second major point in Hegel's philosophy of tragedy is that he suggests that once the tragic act is committed, communities will be destroyed and they will ultimately have to demand justice for their reputation. But by this point in the tragic action, because it tends to be at the tragic end, it's irretrievable and it's completely destroyed. For instance, in Othello, we see in Act 5, once he's committed the act of murdering Desdemona, he claims that he's been deceived and that he should have his reputation restored. Ultimately, from a Hegelian perspective, he's completely damaged his reputation to a point where it's no longer able to be reformed. So the third major feature of the Hegelian tragedy is Hegel's emphasis on the idea that tragedies should be set at the point of a paradigm shift, that is, a change in a pattern or a shift in a structure. So what Hegel's suggesting here is that tragedies should signify the point in history in which we are able to recognise our flaws and are able to move forward and progress. So for audiences and readers when reading or watching a tragedy, it's important to be able to recognise the significance of the tragic action and how that catastrophe could have been prevented. But what we see in Hegelian tragedies are two different types of characters. On the one hand, we have a character who's unable to accept change. And on the other hand, we have characters who are able to set about change. When looking at a tragedy, it's important to consider when was that text actually set? For instance, if it was set during the 19th century, it's gonna make a major difference whether or not it was set at the beginning of the 19th century or the end of the 19th century, where we see a massive revolution of ideas and the transformation of entire moral values. So when looking at a text, applying a Hegelian lens could be a really effective way of understanding the impact that the tragedy has on society and its capacity to move that society forward. So hopefully there I was able to give you a good enough understanding of the main three principles of Hegelian tragedy. If you want to have a look at Hegelian tragedy more, I'd really recommend looking at the idea of tragic collision and his work on dualism. So now we're gonna go even further in time. We're gonna to go to the 19th century to have a look at Schopenhauerian tragedy. So to give you guys a bit of a background of who Arthur Schopenhauer was, Arthur Schopenhauer was a 19th century German philosopher who wrote extensively about the idea of the human will and the metaphysics of society. He produced an extremely famous text called The World as Will and Representation. So in this text, Schopenhauer wrote about the extent to which society crafts the human will and the universal desire to break free. So the first major point to consider when looking at Arthur Schopenhauer's work on tragedy is the fact that he rejects poetic justice. From Arthur Schopenhauer's perspective, poetic justice misses the point of tragedy because he believes that tragedy is about committing the crime of existence. Well, to exist in his eyes is to submit yourself to humanity and allow society to craft your fortune. So what we see in tragedy is humanity and society corrupting the individual and forcing them on a path that's inevitably going to lead to their doom. So leading on from the first major point where Schopenhauer believes that our will is a property of society, Schopenhauer actually suggests that tragedy signifies rebellion and freedom from a moral world and that actually the act of committing something desperately tragic is a cry for help and a way of escaping sort of the brutality and dictatorship of the moral universe that we exist in. So looking at texts like Tess of the Durbervilles, where Tess is ruthlessly criticised by her society, the act of actually submitting herself to her own death is in many ways freeing for her and liberating because it allows her to free herself from the judgement of the moral world that surrounds her. From the reader's perspective, we in many ways sympathise with Tess because we understand and appreciate the oppression that these values have had on Tess's identity and how they've defined her entire existence. So when looking at a tragedy, assess whether or not the text is liberating for the protagonist, even if they have committed a disastrous act. And thirdly, Schopenhauer argues that the reason tragic protagonists chase illusions of happiness is because they're so deeply materialised by the society that surrounds them, so deeply influenced by the values that have defined them. So actually, again, these tragic acts are absolutely freeing for them, despite having such destructive effects on the people and communities that surround them. Albeit a pessimistic note on our own reality, it is in many ways an optimistic understanding of tragedy and its significance. 
So that pretty much summarises what Schopenhauer focused on in his criticism and analysis of tragedy. But a bit like Hegel, I would definitely suggest researching the various criticisms of Schopenhauer and maybe looking at the different essays he produced on tragedy. So obviously, guys, there are various other forms of tragedy, such as a domestic tragedy, um, a tragic comedy, a revenge tragedy, a Roman tragedy, a Greek tragedy. And these are all various forms of tragedy that we can apply these philosophical and critical lenses to. So hopefully by this point in today's video you aren't sick of the word tragedy and that it inspires you to look at tragedy in a completely different way or even potentially read more tragedies. So the way I want to end today's video is by saying a massive thank you to The Study Tree Project for allowing small creators like me to produce content for them um, and I'm really thankful for all they're doing during this really difficult time. So I really recommend guys subscribing down below and taking a look at all of their channels and hopefully you may want to take a look at my channel which is Joseph Edwards or even my Instagram at Educational Tips from Joe. Thank you guys, stay safe.